good Thursday morning, and welcome to the August Virtual Rooster Booster Breakfast, presented by the Greater Owensboro Chamber of Commerce. I'm your host, Chad Benefield, this morning, pulling double duty. I'm in my natural habitat. I'm in the WBKR studio, broadcasting live and doing uh, the Rooster Booster Breakfast with you all this morning, and... Because I'm in my natural habitat, I have some fun surprises I can share with you this morning, including your official good morning song for the Rooster Booster Breakfast. Hit it! Good morning, good morning, how are you? Just fine. Howdy, how do you do? Hello, good day. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> That'll get you up and at it this morning, won't it? Um, so good morning to you, and thanks for being with us. And um, if you are with us, chances are you were just as shocked on Sunday morning we heard the news about our good friend Jack Wells. And in so many ways, uh, this morning's Rooster Booster Breakfast is going to be dedicated to Jack and his legacy here in town. I guess you could say this is the Rooster Booster that Jack built. And to share some very special words about a very special man, our president and CEO of the Greater Owensboro Chamber of Commerce, Candace Bray. Candace, good morning. Since our last Rooster Booster, Owensboro and our business community and our chamber have lost a business giant, a community leader, and a great friend. We ask that you join us at the end of the program as we celebrate and memorialize our 2020 board chair, Jack Wells. Thank you, Candace. And again, you do not want to miss the special tribute to Jack we have planned uh, at the end of today's Rooster Booster Breakfast. But you all know the drill if you're with us. Uh, each morning, we start with an invocation and a pledge of allegiance. Um, so we're going to begin with the invocation and to present that for us this morning, Father Jerry Riney with St. Stephen Cathedral. Friends of the Chamber, I've been privileged to uh, give the opening prayer today. I'm standing above the window of Thomas More, an attorney and a saint who uh, would not go against his conscience. Of course, it cost him his head in the Tower of London, but um, what a great example for us. So let us pray. O oh God, who arrange all things according to a wonderful design and has given us this world as our earthly home, graciously receive the prayers we pour out to you for all countries as we deal with this coronavirus pandemic, that through the wisdom of our leaders and the integrity of citizens, harmony, wholeness, and justice may be assured and lasting co contentment come with peace. Be with leaders of our county, especially with doctors and nurses, those in the medical professions, those on the front lines, as well as so many others who provide needed services for our well-being. Give us the wisdom to work together and for the common good. Bless the leaders of this community our mayor, our judge executive, our commissioners. May God grant them the wisdom of Solomon, the patience of Job, the faith of Abraham and Sarah, the courage of Daniel. Bless all the real leaders in our community who serve generously and selflessly. We stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before us and especially today, we remember Jack Wells, chairman of the Chamber Board, who loved this community, who poured himself out for this community and left his imprint upon us. Be with his family and friends and all who grieve. May he rest in peace eternally. And as we prepare for this approaching academic year, Lord God, in your wisdom and love, you surround us with the mysteries of the universe. You sent your son, Jesus, to teach by word and example that true wisdom comes from you alone. Send your discerning spirit upon school boards and committees, teachers, parents, and students. Fill them with your wisdom and blessings. 
grant that during this academic year, as unique as it may be, students may prosper and continue to develop in body, mind, and spirit. Finally, may God illumine with his light the minds of leaders so that besides caring for the proper material welfare of their people, they may also guarantee them the fairest gift of peace. May God inflame the desires of all people to break through the barriers which divide us, to strengthen the bonds of mutual love, to learn to understand one another. Through God's power and inspiration, may all peoples welcome each other to their hearts as brothers and sisters, and may the peace for which we long ever flower and ever reign among us. Amen. Father Ronnie, thank you very much. And now uh, we'll move on to our Pledge of Allegiance. And I gotta say, this is pretty cool. Uh, this morning, since we have a virtual Rooster Booster breakfast, we're gonna be joined by a U.S. Congressman. That's right. So please join me. I know you're at home, but you can still join me. You can give thumbs up and hearts and all that good stuff on social media. Please join me in welcoming for our Pledge of Allegiance, U.S. Congressman Brett Guthrie. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Congressman Guthrie, thank you so much for being with us this morning here in our virtual Rooster Booster Breakfast for August. And if you were just joining us on social media this morning, we want to thank you for being with us as well. And right now, it's the time in our program where we get to do something really, really cool. We get to give some recognition to our brand new chamber members. And if you are one of those brand new chamber members, we want to say welcome. Uh, first of all, you're going to love the Rooster Booster Breakfast, whether it's virtual or whether it's in person. You're gonna love the perks that you get with being a chamber member. And honestly, since I'm in the WBKR studio this morning, I can just tell you right now, it's gonna be good times. <laughs> this is so good, right? Y'all know you know the words. Wait, get the bike! <laughs> Wait for the big ending. The ending is the way to go. Hold on. New members, this is for you. Come on! Okay, got that out of my system. Take it away, Jacqueline, with our new member intros. Blue Line Entertainment has mastered the entertainment industry in the tri-state area for over 25 years. Specializing in wedding, corporate, school, and private events, they take pride in keeping dance floors full. Whether your event needs sound, light, or video assistance, they are ready to take it to the next level and let it become the one event everyone will be talking about. They love this community and being a part of Owensboro. Welcome Blue Line Entertainment. Let's boogie. Founded in Auburn, Alabama in 2008, Chicken Salad Chick serves full-flavored, southern-style chicken salad made from scratch and served from the heart. With more than a dozen original chicken salad flavors, as well as fresh side salads, gourmet soups, signature sandwiches, and delicious desserts, Chicken Salad Chick's robust menu is a perfect fit for any guest. They have received numerous accolades, including rankings in Franchise Times Fast and Serious, FastCasual.com's Top Movers and Shakers, and Entrepreneur's Top Food Franchise for the second consecutive year. Chicken Salad Chick offers a unique and warm culture, a simple concept, and a superb experience. Welcome to Owensboro Chicken Salad Chick. 
At DC Plus, they specialize in providing IT services and solutions to small businesses and manufacturing organizations. The veteran-owned company is driven by their belief in strategic growth and innovation. As a small business, they have unique insights into the challenges you face. They know you need IT support that's user-friendly, flexible, and able to grow and change with your business. Their team understands the unique needs of manufacturing environments as well. They provide proactive support and manage services to businesses of all sizes. They care about your business goals and design solutions with those goals in mind. Welcome, DC Plus. Lucas Oil Center was founded in 2008 by automotive industry veterans Bill and Brenda Floyd. The Floyds, with the enthusiastic support of Lucas Oil Products, began their quest to design and build a multifaceted Lucas Oil branded auto service center and car wash. Lucas Oil Center is determined to provide the best auto care service and car wash facility in USA right here in the tri-state area. They are excited to soon be expanding into the Owensboro market. Welcome to Owensboro, Lucas Oil Center. Make-A-Wish Kentucky creates life-changing wishes for Kentucky children with critical illnesses. In an effort to better serve Owensboro and Western Kentucky kids, Owensboro native Lisa Reeves will lead a new Western Kentucky Make-A-Wish office. Make-A-Wish is more than wish granting. It's a global movement of transforming lives through hope. Now more than ever, that hope is essential. All money raised locally stays locally to make wishes come true for Western Kentucky kids. Make-A-Wish is not a last wish organization. A vast majority of WISH kids go on to beat their illnesses and live typical, healthy lives. Since their founding in 1983, they have granted more than 2,000 wishes for Kentucky kids. Welcome, Make-A-Wish Kentucky. Owensboro Atlas Center empowers each person by bringing hope into their lives. As they aim to restore proper nerve system function, their purpose is to unlock each individual's infinite healing potential so they can become the best version of themselves. It is their mission to restore the health of our community members through specific upper cervical chiropractic care. They are committed to bringing hope, health, and healing to individuals and their families to reach their God-given potential. Welcome Owensboro Atlas Center. Premier Medical Group is a physician-owned practice that can trace its origin to 1950. They provide comprehensive inpatient and outpatient primary care to adult patients in Owensboro and surrounding counties. Their providers also have a special interest in the treatment of diabetes, thyroid disorders, and other endocrinology conditions. Divisions of the practice are Premier Aesthetics, Premier Lab, and Premier Clinical Research. They were the recipients of the 2020 Messenger Inquirer Gold Reader's Choice Award for Best Medical Group. Welcome, Premier Medical Group. Sean Higgins is a realtor with Remax Professional Realty Group here in Owensboro. He is a retired colonel in the U.S. Army and will bring his focus, professionalism, and devotion for service to his future real estate clients. He is a native of Hopkinsville, graduated from UK, and holds an MBA from Regis University. Sean's goal is helping people make the right financial decisions and asks you to call the Colonel at 270-305-2215. Welcome Sean Higgins with Remax Professional Realty Group. Jacqueline, thank you very much. And to all of our new members, thank you and welcome aboard to the uh, Greater Owensboro Chamber of Commerce. Okay, it is time to introduce you all to our breakfast sponsor. And yes, what's that I see over my shoulder? What is that I see? Well, my friends, that is the official website of our breakfast sponsor this morning. Yes, indeed. That is the official website of the Greater Owensboro Realtor Association. Uh, yeah, so thank you all very much for sponsoring our August Rooster Booster Breakfast. And again, we know, you know, our Rooster Boosters the last few months because of COVID-19 have been very, um, how do I say, non-traditional. But uh, the cool part about it is we can still all get together on social media and celebrate this community and all of our small and uh, local and uh, large businesses in it. So uh, thanks for being with us. And thanks to the Greater Owensboro Realtor Association for sponsoring the breakfast. And now uh, a word from our breakfast sponsors. Good morning, Chamber. We live in unprecedented times, but through COVID-19, the real estate industry remained essential and realtors rose to the challenge with innovative marketing, meticulous care to follow the Healthy at Work guidelines, and by making your home our priority. Real 
Realtors are not just real estate agents. All agents go through a process of education and licensure, but Realtors go above and beyond. Realtors abide by a code of ethics that commits us to ethical standards beyond what the law requires, including commitments to competency, fairness, and high integrity. The very first article of the Code of Ethics pledge us to protect and promote the interest of our clients. So as a realtor, you know, we go through the licensing courses to become a licensed real estate agent so we can sell real estate. And becoming the realtor part of it, you can be a real estate agent. There's a difference between a real estate agent and a realtor. A realtor um, is held to a code of ethics and we could get in a lot of trouble if we don't do things right and care about our clients and our customers and just do the right thing. As realtors, we are a part of something bigger than ourselves. From a national association with over 1 million members to our local association with 220 realtor members and 100 affiliates across five counties. We are connected to local professionals who help get our clients from open house to the closing table. Appraisers, home inspectors, title companies, loan officers, insurance providers, you need the right team to provide you with the best experience. The realtors and the affiliates in Owensboro area, um, for us, it's almost like a big family. Everybody cooperates together really well. We enjoy it. We have a, a strong um, collaboration, I think, between the affiliates, and I, and I think that that is very rare. Um, you know, I talk to loan officers and other branch managers from other parts of the country, and they are not as involved with the Realtors Association like we are. The home we were buying had to sell. They had to, uh, they had to find a property. Our home had to sell, and it just kept going down the line. I think there were six parties involved to where they all had to close in a very tight time frame, and it just would not have been possible. I mean, trying to, trying to go alone without a Realtor. The most popular question we get is, how's the market? With a record setting $31 million in sales volume, June 2020 was the best June and highest monthly sales volume in five years. Even in a pandemic, the market is roaring. A high June pending listings signal a continuing strong market through the summer. No matter your needs, realtors are ready to assist you in navigating multiple offers, COVID-19 pandemic, and a tight inventory to get you the best price for your home. Whether in pandemic or paradise, we'll bring you home. Now let me ask you a question. Who's, Who's your, your realtor? realtor? Let me ask you a question. Who's your realtor? So again, a huge shout out to the Greater Owensboro Realtor Association for being our August Rooster Booster Breakfast Sponsor. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so uh, it is time to introduce our featured speaker. I just want to say, uh, before I introduce the person who's going to introduce the featured speaker, I'm kind of having a little bit of a fanboy moment um, because not only is the featured speaker a local sports star slash legend, um, he's also become quite a strong voice in activism, which I appreciate. That speaks to my heart. So um, I'm probably going to sit here the entire time he talks and just like completely wig out. Uh, <laughs> So because of that, I will not be doing the formal introduction. Uh, to do that, um, our past board chair here at the Greater Owensboro Chamber of Commerce, y'all please welcome uh, to our virtual Rooster Booster Breakfast to introduce August featured speaker, it's my friend Dave Roberts. Well, good morning, Owensboro. I'm Dave Roberts, your past board chair. And I find it only fitting today, on the day that we're remembering the life and celebrating the life of, of one Owensboro legend, that our guest speaker is an Owensboro legend in his own right. Rex Chapman's a name that um, many of us know for uh, folks of, of my age, uh, grew up idolizing uh, Rex as he um, moved through his high school, college, and, and, and professional careers. Uh, Rex Chapman is a former UK and NBA basketball player who now focuses his time uh, as a broadcast analyst and a social media influencer. Uh, Rex began his basketball career as a standout athlete at Apollo High School, where he rewrote the record books 
en route to All-State and All-American recognition. After high school, Rex took his talents to the University of Kentucky, scoring over 1,000 points in his two seasons as a Wildcat. He began his NBA career with the expansion Charlotte Hornets in 1988, going on also to play with the Washington Bullets, the Miami Heat, and the Phoenix Suns. After retirement in 2000, Rex held a number of executive positions across the NBA and broadcasting organizations. He currently hosts the UK pregame show before every Wildcat basketball games on the UK radio network and keeps his nearly 1 million Twitter followers engaged with his growing media presence. Ladies and gentlemen, please offer a warm Rooster Brewster welcome to Rex Chapman. Thank you, Dave, so much, and good morning, everyone. Welcome to Rooster Booster. We are so excited for this morning. I know what you're thinking, like, man, Rex has changed. Don't worry, he's here, he's with us. Rex, good morning, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you being here. Thank you for having me. I love my, I love my city of Owensboro. My goodness, uh, what great memories. Oh, we're going to talk about your Owensboro memories coming up. Don't worry. But first, I have to get your opinion. The world right now is like, what is it going to throw at us this week? Like, what are we going to get? So we have to talk about what the NBA is doing because I have to get your opinion on the bubble because of COVID restrictions. Thank goodness sports are back because we all need sports. And the NBA has done, I think, a really good job of giving us a product. The NBA, I couldn't be proud, more proud of my league, of our league. Uh, you know, when Rudy Gobert got, I got sick initially back in spring, um, the NBA shut everything down immediately. And as you saw, the rest of the country sort of followed suit. And now, you know, this is our third week in a row of zero guys testing positive for COVID while inside the bubble. I couldn't be more proud. And then on top of it, product i was worried about how it was look you know without fans there but i gotta tell you it, it's just to have the squeaking of the shoes on and the announcers in the background has just been music in my ears i didn't really i knew i missed it but man it's good to have basketball back you know one thing i loved about the nba coming back was the players attitudes about having an option to be able to get out there and to work, mm -hmm. to be able to play. And a, a couple of people had asked the guys like, is this championship going to mean any less? Should there be an asterisk? And everybody was like, are you kidding? Do you know how hard it's going to be to win this championship? And I think that has a message there. I think there is too. And you know, uh, you, you really don't know what you have until it's gone. And I know even as professional athletes, you get spoiled and you like, ah, oh, I got to go to practice today. I think, but for a lot of Americans right now, I have friends, you know, I've retired at 32 and I knew what it was like to all of a sudden have nothing to do and no purpose. I hadn't prepared for it. Everybody in the country's kind of gotten a jolt of what instant retirement is like. And I know for a lot of my buddies, it, it's really been hard. So it's kind of be careful what you wish for. Uh, I know for our players, I'm envious of those guys right now. It's like going to two months of summer basketball camp, locked down, and where all you're, all you're there to do is play basketball. I know they're going to miss family, kids, and birthdays, and there's a big sacrifice going on. But it's the greatest job in the world. It really is. You know, you got your summers off. You can play golf, basketball. I, I rec highly recommend it. <laughs> so speaking of, and we'll stay on it, basketball, late 80s, you played in the NBA for 12, 13 years. You've done a lot of different roles in the administrative um, aspect of the NBA as a broadcaster. You've been able to watch basketball and be right there. What's it like to be able to watch the game of basketball evolve literally right before your eyes? I mean, you're seeing the whole game change. What's that like? Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty neat. You know, I... Uh... You know, we all tend to kind of, it's kind of the whole get off my lawn thing you get as, as you're an older person. We all tend to think our era is the best and the toughest and the most noble. Nah, come on. I, I'm, and I do, shoot, I was built, I was 6'3", 185 pounds. I was built for today's NBA. 
you know, um, not battling other six, eight, 220 pound two guards was, which is what I went against most every night. Um, in a different era where you could hold and grab and, you know, it was a lot more physical. Uh, but man, what these guys can do anymore, we could all handle the ball. Some these guys, the way they handle the basketball now, not only with their strong hand, but also with their weak hand and the way they, the way they shoot it. I mean, if I, if I drove the basket nine times out of 10, I'm going to finish with my right hand. The way these guys can finish with either hand, lay it off the glass. Um, it's just a beautiful game. And the way they can shoot, the way they can shoot the three off the dribble is I, – I, I'll go out with my son sometimes, and he can do all that stuff. He's 27 now. But he can do all that stuff, and I'll try it, and I just kick it out of bounds every time. I don't I – don't, it's like they're playing a different game. I'm amazed by it, and I love it. It's beautiful. So you mentioned your era, so I have to ask. A gift that was given to all of us in quarantine was the last dance. Right. So we all I was a child of the 90s. So for me, watching it back, like I'm calling my mom, like, Mom, do I still have my starter jacket? Like, do you know where it is? Like, is it in the attic? So yeah. when, when, when you go back and you're watching this, which I'm assuming you watched it. Yeah. What was it like to play on the same court as Michael Jordan? Are you intimidated? Are you thinking I'm going to show this guy what I'm made of? Like, what is that like? Yeah, you know, at the time, uh, well, I think also at the time, we knew Michael was great. We knew he was way different than any of the rest of us. And I don't like saying that. I mean, as a, as I really don't, uh, as, a, as a competitor, you don't like to let tell anybody that, you know, they're better than you are. Also, at the time, he was three or four or five years older than I was. He's still, you know, we, he hadn't won titles yet. So it was, it was this building that you, that you see. We knew he was different. And no, never scared. Uh, you always want to – I always – playing basketball, honest to goodness, in Owensboro, Kentucky, against the teams that I and we played against at OHS, they prepared me not only for those moments, but for, as a young person. Um, I had – there were three guys specifically, David Hogg, Marcus Robinson, and Avery Taylor, who played for OHS, who were every bit as good as I was as a 15-year-old. And I got to go to camp uh, one summer when they didn't get to. And, and I got more exposure. Unfair. We can talk about that later. But what I did know, those guys prepared me to go play outside the state. I wasn't going to go play in Philadelphia or New York and play against anybody any better than those three guys in my hometown who I play against and play with in the summers on the same team and play against each other in the high school team. It was awesome. Those guys helped. And those games against OHS, AHS, OHS, they, they served me so well. Uh, I mean, I, by the time I left Owensboro, I, I had, I felt like I had played in so many pressure packed situations in front of thousands of fans. And I had, so uh, it's just something I, I, uh, I'll always cherish. Let's talk about the building blocks because we live in a time where we want it and we want it now. We want fame now. We want success now. We want to be, you know, financially free right now. And the reality is that's not how it works most of the time. And I think sometimes when we're in those, those beginning stages or even as we start to make some, some noise in our careers, we, I think, take advantage of where we are at the moment and how that's preparing us for where we're going. So how important is that? You know, and you just talked about it, you know, and for us, you know, you've got the, you've got the business community listening to you. You've got your hometown listening to you. How important are those building blocks of today for our future? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty basic, but, you know, if, you, if you're going to go to the gym and work out, and you're going to get on the bench press the very first day and you, you put a hundred, whatever you put on there, however much weight and you go try to try to do 20 reps of whatever it is, you'll fail miserably. It'll fall, but it, you'll crush your chest. You'll be all bruised and battered. The reps, the reps and the work 
every single day, whatever you're doing, the reps are what gives you confidence. It's like you asking me, was I intimidated playing against Michael Jordan? No. Now, if I hadn't worked my whole life to be there and uh, I just woke up one morning and had to go out there and play against him, damn right, I'd probably be pretty intimidated. I had worked my whole life for it, and I knew I didn't skip any steps coming up in Owensboro, Kentucky. I started playing ball every day from the time I was eight or nine. I was committed to it. Nobody coast to coast was going to have worked harder than I was going to work that day. And my friends, black and white, city and rural in Owensboro, Kentucky, older than me, uh, guys I played against, guys my dad coached, all those people contributed to helping me be tough enough and good enough to go on and play play a game of basketball for a living. I mean, truly blessed. So I want to talk about your platform because I think athletes especially – your entire life, you're on a platform. We love athletes. There is, some people want to be rock stars. Everybody wants to be a star athlete. So you've had a platform your entire life, and now it's a little different. So let's talk about Twitter for just a second. Mm -hmm. 900 and something thousand people are like, yes, Rex Chapman's my guy. I follow him. I follow you. I don't know. When I look at your posts, I'm like, am I going to laugh? Am I going to cry? Am I going to cringe? <laughs> like, yeah, I don't yeah. know. But you have this incredible platform. And one thing, there's a lot of negative things about social media. But one thing that I like is that there's so much of that content that's relatable to other people. How important is that right now? It's hugely important. You know, I, I, I was a, an All-American high school, maybe arguably the best player in the country in high school. Um, all-American in college, a lottery pick in the NBA. And a year out of playing in the NBA, I was, you know, had a, uh, or not a year out, uh, but it started a, a big time painkiller problem. And that happened for, that went on for, for 14 years. Um, in and out of rehab. I was in, in and out of rehab three times. Um, life is weird. And, and life is really, it's really hard. And, you know, I had it. I've had it good and I've had it not so good. This life can get you down. And sometimes when you're down, just like right now, you know, people are scared. Uh, I'm scared. I, we don't know what's going on. You hope you're going to have a job next week. You hope, you know, I'm, you know, food banks, we're seeing lines at food banks. And I just remember there being a time where shoot a couple nights, I was staying in my car. So I've been down on my luck. And what I know is, you can't get through it alone. You can't isolate yourself. You got to be humble enough to ask for help, you know, um, and sometimes just a hot meal or a friendly smile or a hug can get you from one night to the next morning where you got a whole new day to try to continue to do the right thing. So I don't know why I started talking about that, but I did. I'm glad you did because I, I had on here, I, I wanted to talk to you about the valleys because and this is nothing new. I always, you know, we, we, we harp on the way that our society is now, but the truth is, is that it's been this way forever. Mm -hmm. We tend to focus on the mountaintops because that's where, that's where you're doing, you know, a snow angels and confetti rain after the Super Bowl. That's when you're celebrating yeah. all these wins. And, and the truth is, is that I think we learn more and we grow more from the valleys than perhaps we do the mountains. So when we're in those low points, what do you think it is that makes it so hard? What do you think the hardest thing is about getting out of those dark low moments? Well, it obviously depends on what those low moments are, but you know, I think that having, having allies, you know, having friends, a good group of friends or family that, that you can talk to about things that are bothering you. You know, I, I've, I've, uh, Gosh, I've seen a therapist for 15, 20 years now, and it, that's really good for me. It, it's good for me to, you know, kind of air out some of the things that go on in this crazy head of mine, you know, from time to time. I can work myself into a bad mood like nobody's business, just to wake up in a bad mood. And uh, so that's stuff I've had to work on. Um, and whether it's therapy or whether it's just a, a really good friend, ally, a, a, a spouse, or I mean, Life is hard. Life is weird. And 
man, you got to work at it every single day. You, it, it's, it's like marriage. It's, you know, you don't get married and then, okay, we're married. We're not going to work on our relationship anymore. No, working on your relationship is every day. Working on your basketball game is every day. Working on your health is every day, mental and physical. So, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, hey, I think more than anything, when you're feeling down, don't feel alone, man. There's a lot of people that are out there and, and you never know what's going on in somebody's head. So, uh, you know, take a moment always to say hi and give a, give a friendly smile because you don't know that it may just get that person through the next day. So when you're, you're talking about this and one of the things that I think you can't help but love about you is how open you are um, and how honest you are. And I think, Mental health is one of those things that has always had this stigma. And I think a mm -hmm. lot of it is attached to an old mindset of, well, that's the way we do it, or that's the way things have always been done. Um, we see that a lot. We see that a mm -hmm. lot today when it comes to ways people do business and the way relationships are, are, are run and in social issues. How do we get over that mindset of this is how it's always been done and let me see how we can do things differently. Yeah, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. I, going back, I can think about, you know, and from the outside looking in, if, if every people who knew me, you know, who might be watching this from way back when, if you saw me from age, you know, 15 to 20 or 30, um, you go, oh man, perf what a perfect life, just money and kids and, playing ball and and I and I can tell you and my friends can tell you there Jeff Sanford knows um, um, I always struggle with my with my head you know I quit our high school basketball team I was the best player in the state going to Kentucky and I quit our basketball team I just emotional and I, I would lose my mind um, I got to Kentucky uh, was everybody's darling and all that stuff and I couldn't get into any of the bars where my friends were going uh, I was too young. If I got in, they would let other underage guys on the team in. But if they let me in, they would be like, nah, if we let you in. The cops are going to come and we'll get in trouble. And then at that point, I found myself sleeping a lot in college. I, I either because I couldn't I couldn't really go out. Um, and so I was either playing basketball practice or sleeping and and chasing some girls. OK, you got me. <laughs> uh, but but. No, but that, that's very true, though. That was also, you know, me just trying to escape my mind and staying, just try, really f trying to fight off my depression. And so I fought with that for years and years. And um, uh, it's not, you know, I, I think that used to be a really unpopular thing to say, really unpopular to say out loud. And especially if you were a white male growing up in the South, not popular guess what? We all have it to a degree. Some of we don't all have it. Some of us do have it. Our kids have it. And you got to, we got to talk about mental health. We got, we, we must, it's got to be more open, but think about it. What took for, what it took for me to open up and talk about it is crashing and burning to where I could be so vulnerable. I always felt like I was sort of carrying around a bit of a secret you know, that, that I couldn't. And so there was a part when I did, you know, got in trouble and I'm plastered on the front of the news and all that. There was a part of that that made me feel like, like I could exhale and, you know, and so anything from this point on is easy. I want to talk to you about something else um, that I feel like is one of those, those topics that's hard to talk about. And mm -hmm. I think one reason is because there's a lot of passion that's all the way around it. And, and I want to talk about, um, I'm talking about Owensboro. I okay. want to talk about the Owensboro that, that you grew up in. Um, I think one of the gifts of playing sports is that it forces you to be around people who don't look like you, who don't live like you, who don't love like you, who have a very different upbringing. It puts you on the same team so that you have a common goal, or it puts you as enemies, which can make some type of division grow. Um, talk to me about, as an athlete and as a human being, what you've seen 
growing up in Owensboro, what you've seen outside of Owensboro when it comes to social issues. I have a great affinity for Owensboro and I had an absolutely beautiful time growing up in Owensboro. And I think we're a little bit more diverse because we have a bigger city in Evansville, a little bit more of an urban population there. And therefore we have a little bit of a more urban population in Owensboro than we do in many pockets in the state of Kentucky. And I think we're lucky in that regard. Um, man, I am so, I'm so blessed to have, I can't imagine what my life would be like without all the black and brown friends that I have. And it's not about being woke. You can only be woke so much. It's, I'm, all, I'm a white man. I'm a wake up a white man. I, get the, I have the luxury of learning about racism. My friends wake up black every day and they experience it every single day. You know, we got to teach, we, get, we need to teach history a little different in Kentucky. When I was growing up, second or third grade, you learn about slavery. I remember learning about it and looking around the room like, did you guys just hear what they said? And in a week, we were on to another chapter and that was it. They, no, it's got to be taught with context. When slavery ended, we didn't give slaves. Men, grown women, first of all, we didn't teach them how to read. We hadn't taught them. So they, we've got a 90 yard head start in a hundred yard race and they're playing catch up, man. So now that I've gotten that out of the way, me growing up in Owensboro, I, I've already, I, and I had, I talked with the, some other people today a little bit about this. Uh, my dad was a, a basketball coach there in Owensboro, but before that he was a young man growing up in Davis County, went to Davis County high, was a terrific basketball player. His uh, best friends from in the city, predominantly black athlete, uh, predominantly sports were predominantly black at OHS at the time. Also, uh, Charlie Taylor, one of my dad's good friends, uh, Marshall, uh, oh gosh, uh, Marshall Stewart. Um, these guys, they grew up with my dad when he was a teenager. So by the time, and they all went off to co play college ball and stuff, and then they all settled in Owensboro. So now I've got built-in friends his friends have kids my age, Avery Taylor, Chucky Taylor. Um, so I would be dropped off, you know, in five, six, seven years old, um, down on fifth street. And I would hang out out there for the weekend. And I knew I would see what it was like in a five bed, four bedroom house where I live. And when I would go to fifth street and some of my friends had two rooms in the whole place, no heat or no air conditioning, uh, seven, eight people, um, maybe three meals a day, maybe not. Um, people were making me get my grades. You know, some of my friends, their, their families literally, you know, working night shifts, mom, you know, maybe not working at all, maybe not doing well at all. So I had a lot of advantages that I know. And I, I want to say this too. These guys, I've already said, these guys help prepare me for, for, you know, going on athletically. But I go back to a, a point where I was about 15. And, you know, my guys, Jeff Sanford and Greg Vaughn and, and all the guys I played with at Apollo, um, this was the summertime. And I played with uh, my guys from OHS in the, in the summertime. I, I would play with those guys on AAU on our AAU team. We we torched everybody. We won the state. We were like third in the nation, and there were four of us on that team that were pretty good at the time. None of us were any better than the rest. We were all about six feet tall, you know, fifteen years old. Me, Marcus Robinson, uh, David Hogg, and Avery Taylor. Ask anybody that knows back then, and. All four of us got invited based on that, based on that tournament, national tournament. We all got invited, uh, it was, which was a big deal at the time, to go to an invitational camp. It was called uh, BC All-Stars. It was in Georgia. Even though you were invited, you still had to pay something to go. And it was, you know, at the time, it could have been $150 or whatever it was. Well, only one of us got to go. And it was me. My dad coached at the college, even though he went to Ellis Park 
and played cards and did all that stuff with Avery's dad and all those guys every single day of the week. My dad coached at the college and I had the $150 to go. And so what ended up happening from there on now, yeah, maybe at some point I kept getting better and maybe they peaked a little bit. Also, they didn't have the same home advantages that I had. Also at that point, yeah, I went to that camp and because they had beat me up so many days playing ball, those three guys, all the time growing up, I went and I killed at that camp. I, I, there was nowhere I was going to go that I wasn't going to be better because of the, those guys. They didn't, have the, they didn't have the privilege of going to the camp. And what happened from that point on was I started being recruited way more than those guys were. And then, you know, you had to make your grades. And I had people helping me, you know, stay on top of my grades. So there were built-in built in disadvantages that my friends had that I didn't. And then I'll go on a little bit further and a little deeper. Um, you know, Mark Higgs from Owensboro, Kenny Higgs, the, the athletic Higgs family, Dwight Higgs and all them. I grew up with these guys. I grew up with Mark. Mark was two years older than me. Mark's younger sister, Sean, uh, was my age, same grade. Sean and I dated uh, junior and senior year all through high school. It was really weird. We, we were kind of shamed into keeping it from everybody. And uh, we did just because we thought that's what we were supposed to do. All of our friends knew, of course, and it was kind of beautiful. We, they were our arch rivals. And there was my girlfriend cheering for the other team. Uh, and so I, I want to say, you know, I don't even know that I've said this out loud or in an Owensboro form at all, ever. And uh, I feel really bad about all of it. I mean, it's shameful to hide, you know, that you like, that you like, or it's shameful being made to, to um, hide that you like someone based solely because of the color of their skin. Uh, before I came to college, I realized, you know, but well before I was alive, 20 years, maybe black athletes didn't even weren't allowed to play sports. Uh, they couldn't play division one basketball. They could, it, the NBA was an all white league. My whole life growing up has been infused with black culture, hip hop, Prince, Michael Jackson. They're my earliest memories, all of that stuff. And to tell me on one hand, these work hard and you can do this. You can only like someone so much though. You can only love someone so much. That's wrong to me. It always has been wrong to me. And look, I know we all have our views and some of them are based on, you know, beliefs. Some of them are based on other things. Um, we're all trying to get better here. And the one thing I will tell you, until you've sat down with an individual person, regardless of the race, color, creed, religion, Unless you've sat and talked with that person, please try not to, to put somebody in a corner because you don't know their life. You don't know what they've been through. Um, and almost always you can find some common ground if you sit and talk with that person. So, hey, we're all just trying to get a little bit better each and every day. I, I can't thank you guys enough for having me on to do this. Uh, got anything else? I do want to ask you this. As a community, obviously with us, as a, you know, we're a community organization and our mission is to grow greater Owensboro. We want it to be a better place. We love what it is, but we see the potential for this community. And I know that you do too. I do. How do we, as a community, collectively look at diversity as an issue? And how do we make this community a more diverse community? What can we do as a community, as an organization, as an individual, as a company? Um, what are some things that, that you feel like maybe we could be doing that could be helping us to grow? This is probably a little bit above my pay grade, but I've always been very <laughs> proud of Owensboro. Um, and how and how it's and how it's done racially, um, you know. I, I still think the biggest the big 
the biggest bringing of people together in Owensboro every year. I don't know that it's the barbecue fest. It, 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 it used to be when I was young, it was the Dust Bowl, man. The Dust Bowl. That everybody, white, black, everybody congregates on Fifth Street and you watch basketball for a whole week there. There's no color. There's no, there's no anything. As far as businesses go, you know, hiring practices, man. You know, if you want, if you want to have a more diverse community, hire, hire more diverse people other than just, you know, local, you know, uh, Ang white Anglo Saxon Protestant, make it, you got to make the effort, got to make the effort. And w once you do that, you know, you, people come, they come from outside of town. They, they establish roots and their kids grow up in the, Oh, and I've said, I have said this from the time I've been young and obviously I'm biased that the only place I've grown up. I did grow up in Frankfurt for a year and, and in Hallsville for a couple of years, but Owensboro is so beautiful. It's a perfect size city. It really is, you know, 50,000, 60,000 people. You got four terrific high schools. <laughs> um, and I've been gone for a while from the local sports scene there, but you know, my, my buddy's son, Jeff Sanford, Dylan Sanford, won the state tournament a few years ago. It makes me want to cry just thinking about it. It really does uh, right now. We worked so hard to do it, and we couldn't get there. And then one of his kids does it. Go, Dylan. Um, it's just a, it's a good city, man. It's, uh, I, I, I'm proud of it for, for very many different reasons. And obviously, I have truly great memories there growing playing southern little league baseball and not being very good so learn to swim that was my first sport i still that's really all i do for exercise uh but i love owens bro and i just think you, you got to continue dialogue and the the black lives matter and and what we're going through with the civil unrest right now don't let it fade you know this is what happens you know i've been around long enough people get upset and then they it's like the pandemic it's not over just because you're over talking about it. It, it it this is a like horse racing this is not a sprint race this is a route race and you better have some endurance for the pandemic you better have some endurance for what's going on socially because i think this is a, this is a period of time that i think we're all going to look back on and and i hope be very proud of Rex, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your honesty. And um, thank you for continuing to be an active community member, no matter where you park your car at night. Um, <laughs> we really, we appreciate you. We appreciate what you're doing. Um, thank you for sharing your story. Um, and Owensboro loves you. You're always welcome to come home. Um, and, and we really appreciate you. Thanks so much. Owensboro, I, I mean, Owensboro's in me. The borough. I love it. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Riggs. I admit it. I had a fanboy moment. I know some of you all had fangirl and fanboy moments, too. You were supposed to. Rex Chapman, thank you for being with us this morning here at the virtual Rooster Booster Breakfast for August. With the Greater Owensboro Chamber of Commerce, we appreciate the words, appreciate the message, and appreciate your presence. So thank you. Um, okay. Uh, thank you for being with us today, and uh, of course, we look forward to the September edition of Rooster Booster, but before we let you go, there's just no more fitting away to end today's uh, virtual session than to pay tribute to Jack Wells. Mentioned very early on in today's Rooster Booster that in so many ways, uh, because of the news that broke on Sunday with Jack's passing at the age of 65, that really, this is the Rooster Booster. This is the edition that Jack built. Uh, so before we go this morning, we're gonna do what has to be done to a man who has been just instrumental into the development of Owensboro. Uh, we're gonna pay tribute to our dear friend and yours, Jack Wells. You know, I, I was speaking with one of Jack's uh, very closest friends recently, and he said every time I talked to Jack, uh, he would always tell me he loved me. And he said, I always knew where I stood because of that. And Jack had a way with I think everyone he encountered, letting them know where they stood and how much he valued uh, that relationship. 
You didn't have to beg Jack into your heart. He walked right in and he changed all of our lives forever for the better. And because of that, he will continue to live on, continue to live on each one of us. Jack was the kind of person that could look into your soul and see the passion that you have for the people that you serve um, and the authenticity of, of that passion. And then once he found that, he supported you wholeheartedly. He had an amazing ability to bring out the best in people. He made everybody happy and he asked nothing in return. Uh, he's a true, true, true friend. Well, oftentimes when you're a young person and you uh, meet someone as successful as Jack Wells, you, know, you go to shake their hand and they, they shake your hand and they kind of look over you, kind of look for that next person uh, to talk to. Jack looked right at you. He genuinely cared. Regardless of, of how much success he had, um, he brought himself with humility and with kindness. Just that consistent what do you need from me, not this is what you need to be doing. That kind of leadership, um, it motivates people and it truly makes a difference in the lives of the people that, that uh, work with you. Jack taught me and us collectively as an organization how to dream. Uh, I, I thought I knew what a, what a dream was, but I quickly found out that I didn't know how to dream like Jack Wells dreamed. We all wanted to work harder and be better because he believed in us and know, knew that we could do more. And we did do more because of him. And it was inspirational to be a part of what he was doing and how he was helping others to achieve and succeed no matter what it took from him. And that should be our goal as we go forward with our lives to make everything and every person around us a little better the way Jack would want us to do. I'll be forever, ever indebted in my love for Jack in teaching me how to dream, how to dream big, and how to make my dreams come true. Thank you, Jack. I love you like a brother. If I had to tell Jack one thing right now, I'd just say, Jack, we miss you, and you have made a lasting impact on our community. And um, for this next generation coming up, we're gonna try to do what you did, and that was encourage people, and really give back to our hometown. We miss you already, Jack. We love you. I hope you know where you stand with us. Rest easy, my friend. <laughs>